Hello and welcome to an Edexcel Computer Science IGCSE past paper question. This is 2022, summer of 2022. At the time of making this video in November of 2022, it is the latest paper. This is paper one, Principles of Computer Science. So it's the theory paper and it's two hours long. So this is the written paper. There is no computers involved in this. And the total marks are out of 80. You must use a black pen. I'm going to write on here, as you'll see, using fill and sign. And there's some advice there. You're not allowed to use a calculator. So we'll jump in and look at question one. But before we do, please do me a favor. Please like this video and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much. Question one, computer systems have both hardware and software components. A, the central processing unit uses the fetch decode execute cycle. State what is meant by the term program instruction. Program instruction is exactly that. It's a task that is carried out by the CPU. Two, state what is meant by the term memory address. It is a pointer to a location in memory. B. Identify the component of the CPU that provides temporary data storage. It is the register because it cannot be any of the buses and it isn't the control unit because that's not what it does. C. The performance of the CPU is affected by the clock speed. Give one benefit of having a higher clock speed. Well, if you've got a higher clock speed, you can process more instructions per second. 2. Give one drawback of having a higher clock speed. More cooling is needed as the CPU will get hotter. D. Identify which one of these describes a sequential compu computational model. Well, it can't be A because program instructions are read one after another from external storage. That's describing how data is stored. B. Program instructions are executed by multiple agents working together. That's, that isn't sequential model. That's describing the multi-agent model. C, program instructions are executed in parallel by different cores. Well, that is describing the parallel computational model. D, program instructions are executed one after another. It is D, which is the sequential model. E, a program can be written in a high or low level language. Give one reason for writing a program in a low level language. My answer is that low-level languages are more efficient and give faster execution of the program. You could also, um, anything about writing code to directly control hardware here, so we're talking about embedded systems which would be programmed in a low-level language, anything about that would be an appropriate answer for this one. Two, state the purpose of an assembler. It is to translate assembly language into machine code. So I'm translating assembly language into machine code. Complete the table by adding one tick in each row to match the description. So we've got compiler and interpreter and we've got the description here. First one there, translates the program each time it's executed. That is interpreter. Produces permanent object code. That is the compiler. So the compiler produces object code. The interpreter does not. Translates line by line. That is the interpreter. Translates the whole program before it's run. That's a compiler. Generates a list of errors once the program has been translated. That's the compiler because remember with the interpreter, you get a list of errors as you go. And that completes question one for a total of 11 marks. Two, computers use binary to represent and store data. The denary number 78 is the ASCII code for the character N. Convert the denary number 78 to 8-bit binary. So to answer a question like this, I draw myself out a table with two rows and eight columns with the place values in here, 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, and 1. And then I place the ones where I need the value. So I don't need 128 because that's too much. Now 64 goes into 78, so I'm going to place a 1 there. But I don't need 32 because 32 and 64 is 96, and that's too much. I don't need 16 because... 16 and 64 is 80, but I do need the 1. 64 and 8 is 72, so I need that. So I'm now 6 short. So I'll take the 4 and the 2, and I don't need the 1 because that would be 79. So 64 plus 8, 72 plus 4, 76 plus 2 is 78. So that is 78 in 8-bit binary. 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. 
Number two, identify the number of characters that can be represented using standard ASCII. It is, of course, B. It's just 128, not 256, which is extended ASCII. So my answer here is B, 128. Three, explain one reason for using Unicode rather than ASCII to encode languages other than English. We need some technical description here. So all of the major language can, languages can be represented with Unicode. That'd be one mark. So it's a big character set. It uses a minimum of 16 bits. So we can represent much more, many more numbers and therefore many more different letters of different languages. For example, Arabic, Japanese, Chinese, etc. And that is two marks. B. Convert the denary number negative 43 to 8-bit binary using sign and magnitude representation. So I want to start this by drawing out my table again. 128, 64, 32, 16, 8, 4, 2 and 1. I'm going to put a note above 128 because that is my MSB or most significant bit. And that is going to be really important and it's not going to be part of my addition. Because this is a negative number, this goes down as a 1. If it was a positive number, it would be 0. But my MSB, 128, is 1. And that's going to denote that this is a negative number. And then I simply go through the table and add the numbers that I need. So I don't need 64, for example. But I am going to need 32, because 32 goes into 43. I'm not going to need 16, because that would be 48. That would be too much, so I'll put a 0 there. But I am going to take the 8, and that will get me to 40. Then I don't need the 4 because that would be too many. That would be 44. But I do need the 2 and the 1 and that is 43. So my answer is 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. Now students often ask me about this. How do I know it's a negative number? Well you will see here quite specifically. I'm going to highlight this. It will say sign and magnitude. So that means you're looking at the MSB and you're looking at a negative number. So that's how we know. We use the MSB and it's going to represent a positive or negative number. So 0 for positive, 1 for negative. 2C, complete the table by adding these two 8-bit binary integers. So we need to remember the rules here. 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 0 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 1, 0. And the final one, 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 1, 1. So with that in mind, we can get started. So in the first column on the right hand side, 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 1, 0. So I place a 0 and carry the 1. Where you place the carry doesn't really matter as long as it does appear in the correct column. So I've now got 0 plus 1, which is 1. 1 plus 1 is 1, 0, again carrying the 1. 1 plus 1 is 1, 0, again carrying the 1. 0 plus 1 is 1. And 0 plus 0 is 0. So you haven't got a calculator in the exam, but if you wanted to work this out as denary numbers and add them up to check if you've got them correct, it's actually 52, which is in the top column, plus 22. So we should come out with 74. So 64 plus 8, 72, plus 2 is 74. So I've got that correct. Just remember the rules that we talked about earlier and you should be able to answer any question like this. The most significant bit column, the 128, if there's a 1, if there's two 1s in there and there's an overflow, it's got something called an overflow and you shouldn't have that in the exam. So you shouldn't have to add up any numbers that would be equal to more than 255 in your exam. Otherwise, you've got an overflow, you've gone to the ninth bit. So at GCSE level, we shouldn't be able to deal with that. So it should be fairly straightforward. D. A bitmap image is made up of pixels. Yep. An image has five colors. Complete the table by adding the unique binary pattern for each color. Each pattern must use the same minimum color depth. So with five colors, we are going to need to use three bits. So with four colors, we can use two bits. And with two colors, we can use one bit. But when we get to five colors, we're beyond four. We need to actually use three bits. That's the minimum that we need. So we just need to place values in there that are appropriate. So green is three zero zero zero. I'm using three bits. Black is zero zero one. White is zero one zero. Red is zero one one. And blue is one zero zero. So any kind of combination like that. And the important thing is you just use three bits because it has to be the minimum. And the minimum here for five colors is three bits.
Two, another image is 3,579 pixels high and 6,128 pixels wide. The image is stored with a 32-bit color depth. The metadata for the image is 732 bytes. Construct an expression to show how the file size in megabytes, and that's been highlighted, megabytes, not mebibytes, so that's a thousand, not 1,024, is calculated. You do not need to do the calculation. So again, you haven't got a calculator, so don't bother doing the calculation. You might get it wrong, and it's a complete waste of time. So just write out the expression. The first thing I do is do the 3579 by 6128, and then I multiply that by 32 bits because each pixel has 32 bits. So multiply that by 32, and that is then in bits. So I need to divide that lot by 8 to get me into bytes, 8 bits in a byte. So at this point, I can add the metadata plus the 732. And I'm going to place that to the side there to show that that's adding that at the byte level. So now I need to get it into megabytes. So I need to divide it by 1,000 and then 1,000 again. But I'm going to keep this simple. I'm going to do divided by 1,000 times 1,000 or 1,000 squared if you want. So divided by a thousand times a thousand, and that is my answer. So each point there, four marks, one mark for the six, three, five, seven, nine times six, one, two, eight times 32. One mark for dividing it by eight and adding 32 and another, another mark, sorry, for adding the 32. So that's three marks there. And the fourth mark for dividing it by a thousand times a thousand. Question three, Alyssa is a music producer. Figure 1 shows the denry values of 5 samples of an analog sound using sample interviews of 0 0.2 seconds. So we've got a sample number there, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the denry value. So here is Figure 1, and we're asked to complete this graph using the sample information from Figure 1 to show the digital sound wave. So sample 1 there is 1, and we need to draw a line as neatly as possible across there. Use a ruler, unlike me, it's just drawing a line like that. And sample 2 is 10 so that comes all the way up here like that and it needs to draw a line across there and we need a line drawn down from here as well again we're trying to use a ruler try and do this as neatly as possible i don't have that option here unfortunately so sample three is 12 so that comes all the way up here so that's gone across there and sample four is five so that's all the way down here again joining this up as neatly possible and sample five is three so that comes down here and there is no sixth sample there so that is the completed graph and that is three marks to give suitable label for the x-axis well along the bottom it should be tight because that looks like seconds and the y-axis is usually amplitude so in a sound sample graph you usually have the x-axis with time and the y-axis with amplitude. B. Alyssa uploads music files to her cloud storage. She compresses the files before she uploads them using a lossless algorithm. Give one disadvantage of using lossless rather than lossy algorithm for this purpose. Well, the file size is going to be bigger, so anything to do with that, the transfer time will be longer. Two. Explain one ben benefit to Alyssa of storing her music files in the cloud. There are lots of benefits of the cloud. As long as you have internet connection, you can access your files, so you don't need to be on the same device. You can save money on secondary storage, so you don't need as big a hard drive as files will be stored in the cloud, meaning less secondary storage space is actually needed. Three, give one possible security issue associated with storing music files in the cloud. Well, a major issue is it could be targeted by hackers. Four, one of Alyssa's music files is stored at the address listed there. Complete the table by adding a description of each URL component. So HTTPS, what is it? It's the protocol. www.cloudisfab.com. What's that? It's a domain name or the name of the website. RE12, what's that? That's some kind of folder directory and ru2.mp3, what is that? That is the file itself and that completes question 3 for a total of 13 marks. Question 4. Reba likes writing programs. She's writing a guessing game. She needs a flowchart to show the logic of the game. 
these are the components needed to draw the flow chart. So you can see you've got various components here using the correct notation. You've got input output there with the parallelogram. You've got a sequence there, number equals 10. You've got selection, guess equals number. And you've got terminators, start and stop. Draw the flow chart for the algorithm in the box on the next page. Use each component once. Do not add any additional components. Use many arrows and yes, no labels as you need. So here's our space to draw the flow chart. To make my life a bit easy with my drawing tools, I've done this in PowerPoint. So we start with the start. Okay, it's a good place to start, but no marks for this. This is fairly obvious. We're going to start with the start stop terminator. So the start here. So then we go into number equals 10. We set number to be 10 at the beginning of the program. Then we're going to get the guess. So the user is going to input the guess. So that's input output there. Then we're going to check the guess. Is the guess equal to number? If no, oops, no match. Iterate back to get guess. If yes, hooray, they match. Stop. So that should be fairly obvious there what's happening. So we start, we set number to 10, we get the guess. Now you could have those two the other way around. You could set number to 10 after you get guess, but then what you're doing then is perhaps you're getting the guess and you're having to run through that again. So it just makes the program a little more inefficient. What you really want to do is set number to 10 at the start and then you get the guess. So if there's no match, then they guess again not setting number to be 10 every time they get that wrong because that makes the program just that bit more inefficient so you've got your selection there guess equals number if yes hooray they match if oops no match and then we stop identify an alternative method for writing the algorithm is it simulation cipher program code or truth table well it's not simulation because that's a completed program it's not cipher because that's a method of encryption it's not truth table because that's looking at testing the algorithm. So it is actually C, it's program code. That is our answer there. B, Rebo wants to develop a program that will convert the temperature in Fahrenheit to Celsius. Here are four steps in the algorithm. The steps are not in the correct order. So you've got A, B, C, and D. A, change the temperature to Celsius, get the temperature in Fahrenheit, show the temperature to Celsius, set the temperature to zero. Give the letter of the step that initializes a variable. It is D, set the temperature to zero. So initializing variable, anything that says set the, set the variable name to whatever value it is. That's the answer there. Two, give the letter of the step that inputs a value. That is B, which gets the temperature in Fahrenheit. C, Figure 2 shows the pseudocode for an early ver version of the algorithm that Reb has written for another game. The algorithm asks the user to input a colour or input negative 1 to end the game. Awards 1 point for red, 8 points for orange, generates a score for the game, displays results of the game. So here you've got your pseudocode, your edXL pseudocode, and it's numbered there all the way down. And what we're asked to do four marks is to trace that through complete the trace table to show the outputs so Reba inputs red orange red red orange negative one so you see the colors there listed on the left hand side and the first row has been completed for you score set to zero red point set to zero orange point set to zero num oranges set to zero so we can see that at the top there lines one two three four and five have been set up like that so Line six is blank, line seven, while color not equal to negative one do. So what that's saying is while color isn't, they haven't input negative one, we can go into the while loop. So line eight, we receive color from string keyboard. If color equals red, then set red point to red points plus one. Now here we can see that color is red. So we set red points to red points plus one. So that is now one. 0 plus 1 is 1. So we don't need to worry about our else on line 11 there. We just go straight back into the loop again. Line 8, receive color from string keyboard. What's color now? The color now is orange. 
So line 8, we've received the colour from string keyboard. If colour equals red, no it's not. Else, if colour equals orange, then set orange points to orange points plus 8. Set num oranges to num oranges plus 1. So orange points equals 8 and num oranges equals 0 plus 1. So that's now 1. So now we've kind of got the gist of the code. We'll go through the rest of it. So now we've got red coming in. So red points equals red points plus 1. So that's now 2. Again, we've got red coming in. So red points equals red points plus 1. So that's now 3. Now we've got orange coming in. So orange points equals orange points plus 8. So that's now 16. And num oranges equals num oranges plus 1. So that's now 2. Now we've got negative 1 coming in. So let's go and have a look at what happens there. So negative 1 has now come in. So colour is equal to negative 1. So now we go down to line 19. We're out the loop. Go to line 19. Set score to red points plus orange points. So that is score here. And that is 16 plus 3. And that is 19. So line 21. Send score and score to display. Send number of reds and red points to display. Send number of oranges and orange points to display. So we've got to do some outputs now. So score is 19. Number of reds, 3. And number of oranges is 16. So 2 and 3 is quite a common question. There's an error in the pseudocode. Where is it and how do we fix it? So let's go and have a look at it. Well, line 23, send num or, number of oranges and orange points to display. Well, that's the number of points that orange has got, not the number of oranges. So we need to change that. That's where the error is. So how do we fix that? Well, we change number of oranges and num oranges to display. So that is our output, and that completes question 4 for 14 marks. Question 5. Visor Health Centre is located in the northeast of England. A. The health centre uses artificial intelligence to provide a symptom checking service for its patients. Patients log onto the website and input their symptoms. Describe how artificial intelligence could identify what's wrong with them. It will match symptoms to possible illnesses. And then having done that, it will give the most likely or most probable illness. Two, give one reason why a patient may not want to use this online service. Well, simply they might just not want to use it. They might want to talk to a real person instead. And that's one mark. There's loads of reasons why they might not want to use it. B, the health centre has clinics in two buildings, Cleveland and Stockton. The network server is in the Cleveland building. One, name the type of network used to access the server from, with, from within the Cleveland building. That is a local area network or LAN. Two, name the type of network used to access a server from the Stockton building. But if the server isn't in the Stockton building, it's in the Cleveland building, then that then becomes a wide area network because it's a bigger network. So it might be further away, further afield. So that's a wide area network. So any network covering a wider area is a WAN, a wide area network. C. The network is at risk of an eavesdropping attack. Identify the description of eavesdropping. Is it A, B, C or D? Well, it's not A, tricking people into giving information by sending emails, pretend to be someone in authority. That's a phishing scam. It's not B, spying on someone using a computer. Is that is shoulder surfing. It's not D. Redirection, redirecting a user from a genuine website to a fake one because that is farming. So it is C, intercepting information as it is transmitted over a network. So when you get a question like this, if you're not sure what the answer is, be sure to read through the responses and use some kind of common sense there and logically work it through. So it couldn't possibly be A because that, that isn't eavesdropping, that is phishing, for example. So move on to D. Doctors use laptops when they visit patients in their homes. Laptops have solid state drives. Explain one reason why a solid state drive is, a, is better than a magnetic hard drive for the laptops. It is more robust in a laptop. So if we think about the context here, it's a laptop, it's going to be more robust. So if the laptop drops, it's less likely to break due to no moving parts. You could also have it smaller, thinner, lighter. It's, it's less noisy than a magnetic hard drive. 
One thing just to be aware of though is the solid state drive will degrade over time. We're talking about many, many years. So data stored on it won't necessarily be there forever because it will degrade over time, unlike a magnetic drive. But for short time, yeah, it is more robust in a laptop. And if you drop the laptop, it's less likely to break because it hasn't got those moving parts. Two, describe how data is stored on a solid state drive. Well, the chips have transistors or electron pools. So these gates or electron pools hold an ele electrical charge and this charge represents ones and zeros. And that's how data is stored in solid state. And these EEPROM chips, electrically erasable programmable read-only memory chips. Three, the laptops have two types of memory. Complete the table by adding one tick to match each description the type of memory used. So RAM or ROM stores the boot up sequence and that is ROM. The contents are lost when the laptop is shut down. That is RAM because RAM is volatile unlike ROM which is non-volatile and that completes question 5 for 12 marks. 6. Santiago manages a computer network for a small business. Networks are based on a topology. Figure 3 shows a network topology. So here we can see a network topology, which is the shape of the network. And that looks like a ring topology. You've got desktop PCs around the edge there and a printer. Fairly simple network. Explain one benefit of this network topology. So it doesn't actually explain what it is. It is actually a ring topology because it looks like a ring. What's the benefits of a ring topology? The data flows unidirectionally, so it can flow quicker in one direction because it can avoid packet collisions. So that's one benefit of the ring topology. Also have no need to have a server. Every workstation gets equal access. Two, the internet is the world's largest mesh network. Explain one reason why a mesh topology is essential for the internet. A mesh topology can handle high volumes of data because traffic can travel in multiple routes. It's self-healing, resilient, which means data will reach its destination even if a connection fails. It's easily scalable. So any one of those are two marks. B. Santiago works on his laptops while traveling by train. There's a free Wi-Fi connection on the plane, but Santiago doesn't use it. He prefers to set up a network between his smartphone and his laptop to connect to the internet. Name this type of network. It is a PAN, or personal, uh, personal Area Network. Two, explain one advantage for Santiago of using the network he set up to connect to the internet rather than the free Wi-Fi connection. A well, big thing is security. Santiago will have a secure cellular data connection as he's not on a public network. By the way, if you couldn't do that, if Santiago couldn't use his network, then he should use a VPN just to protect his data. C. Santiago uses audit trails to help protect the network. 2. Explain what is meant by an audit trail. It's an automatic record of what has happened and who did it. 2. Give one way the data from audit trails can be used to help keep the network secure. It can increase accountability. D. The last question then for 6 marks. Santiago wants to fix, find and fix network vulnerabilities before the reputation of the company suffers. Discuss the methods he can use. Should consider ethical hacking, commercial analysis tools, review of network user policies. So we'll start off with looking at ethical hackers. Well, ethical hackers are employed by the company and they're white hat hackers. They're looking for weaknesses in the network. So they're employed by the company to find weaknesses in the network and point them out so they can be fixed. So now we'll look at commercial analysis tools. So that is specific software that's used to find weaknesses. It can be configured to check for a range of weaknesses reports on these weaknesses when they're found and then they can be fixed. So now we'll look at review of network and user policies. So that is a collection of rules and guidelines that govern the behaviors of network devices. Reviews of this should be scheduled regularly to ensure they are up to date and keep up with everything that's going on. New rules and regulations, for example. So that completes that question for a total of six marks. To get the six marks, you need to show good understanding there of the key concepts, which are what we've got here, the commercial answer sort of review of network and user policies, for example. It needs to be well developed. So look at all three things here 
in order. So we've looked at ethical hackers, commercial analysis tools, and review of network and user policies in the order. So it's logically structured. And that is level three, five to six marks. So that actually completes the whole paper for a total of 80 marks. So a big thank you for watching. If you've made it to the end of the video, please let me know down in the comments that you have. You've watched it all the way through. I really appreciate that. Please let me know how you're getting on with your revision in the comments. I always like to hear from people. Uh, please do me a favor. Again, if you haven't already, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye for now.